Hi, a few months back I was out doing a spot of antiquing when nestled among some VHS I spotted this. Antique shops really have changed since I was a child. It's the Antec Space Invaders game released in 1980, it's a bit worse for wear, so I go and clean it up and restore it back to its former glory. Antex was an American toy and game manufacturer, founded in 1970 by Tony Klaus, Nicholas Galozzi, Nick Underhill, and based straight out of Compton. They originally started with more conventional toys, such as these knockoff Lego sets, but they eventually found their stride with their handheld gaming and tabletop electronic devices. And with their earlier toys, although lock blocks never quite got the recognition off Lego, and probably aren't remembered that far outside the US, they do have their fans. In reading an article about lock blocks, I found this comment in reply to someone suggesting that they didn't click together quite as well as Lego. Hi Ricket. Lock blocks did not need to click together. The blades inside the blocks held them firmly in place. And unlike Lego, they were easy for children's fingers to take apart. I read a lot of uninformed info about Lego on the web, such as lock blocks were a knockoff and Lego had the pattern. In fact, Lego sued Entex and FAO Swartz and lost the case. Their patent used to stop competition was ruled to be fraudulent. They later complained to the Consumer Protection Agency that lock blocks were not equal in quality as stated in Entex ads. The agency made elaborate tests and found them to be equal. Entex were in more stores than Lego at the time, no doubt the set you have will sell for more than your folks paid on the web. I know this stuff as I was the founder of Entex. Have fun, Garth. That's right, the G in GA Clowns stands for Garth. And given that this was written in 2015, and if my research is correct, would make him around 90. So for me, it's just cements him as the legend he was in the toy and game industry. They released over 50 different handholds, with displays varying from LCD to the more well known LED and VFD displays, vacuum fluorescent displays, and they were marketed as games for the more discriminating player and were often said to have a higher build quality than that of their competitors. And in the late 70s and 80s, they were one of the biggest players in the field. Unfortunately, the market for single game handhelds started to dry up, and more and more competitors were entering the field. They did have a foray into cartridge-based systems, starting with the Selector game. Released in 1981, it was only the second handheld cartridge-based system ever to be made, but due to Antex's questionable licensing choices, it ran into some issues. Issues that actually started with this Space Invaders handheld. You see, Midway owned the distribution rights to Space Invaders, so they tried to sue Entex for copyright infringement. But the judge ruled in favour of Entex, claiming Midway only had the distribution rights for the coin operated version of the game, not any handhelds. So Entex got cocky on the selector game and decided to use two more of Midway's titles, Galaxian and Pac Man. But this time they weren't so lucky, and they lost their second bout in court and had to hand over all profits from them games to Coleco, who had officially licensed them. Entex had one last stab at the cartridge based system, this time with a fully licensed game with the Adventure Vision. A tabletop arcade with an effective 150 by 40 LED resolution, and the display was created by 40 LEDs and a moving mirror, and working in a similar way to the display Nintendo used in the Virtual Boy. It wasn't a popular system, with only 10,000 units ever being created, and four games ever being made for it, and excluding the pack entitled Defender. There are only over a thousand copies of each of the other three games, resulting in it now being quite collectible. Entex closed up shop in 1985 and liquidated their assets, but they left quite an impact. One of their handhelds, the Galaxian 2, even featured in the 2005 film adaptation of Doom. Though they got some flack at the time for the actor playing it sidewards, but give the guy credit, maybe he played both parts of a two player game. So this version of Space Invaders was released in 1980. There was a second variant released in 1981 that was reprogrammed and had slightly different gameplay as well as a slightly modified shell design and was affectionately known as the grey one. Although the fact it was grey was just an accident, it was supposed to be the same black as this, but when ordering the shells to be moulded, a mistake was made when writing down the colour on the form. As you can see the battery door is a little broken and it's in need of good clean, so I'm going to take it apart, clean it up and see if I can do something about this door.
There's a couple of screws holding the board in. Now the piezoelectric speaker is held in with a couple more screws. Which is nice as sometimes they're just melted in. This must be the higher build quality that Entex are famous for. So to get the board separated from the case, I now need to desolder it from the battery terminals. I'll then remove all the metal contacts and give them a soak in some vinegar. They're actually in pretty good condition, although they're a little bent up. And so after that soak, I'll just rinse off the vinegar. So while that's happening, I'm going to scrub off the 40 years of grime. During this, I decided to take off the Space Invaders logo, but I've got absolutely no footage of me doing that, so here it is with it off. And I'll reattach it at the end when everything's clean and dry. So here we have the board, and as you may have expected, there's not much to it. The screen is on a separate board entirely, and is connected via some pretty stiff ribbon cables. The screen itself is a 6x8 LED matrix, and the image is the result of the filter on top. So it's the same image for the bullets as it is the ships. So quite rightly you're shooting ships up to shoot the ships down. That makes sense. The score is made up of these 7 segment displays, and as you can see there's actually 4 displays, but they only ever show 3. No one's expecting a score that high. As it's an LED matrix, there's this bank of transistors, and that's there just to switch through as it cycles through the rows to make up the images. And it's a combination of the rows and the columns being on or off to decide which LEDs are on, and it goes through one line at a time. And it's the persistence of vision that will make up the image, giving you the impression that multiple rows are on at any one time. The chip controlling it all is the Texas Instruments MP1211. It's a 4-bit microcontroller based on the TMS1000 series, and was used in things such as the speaker spell, and was quite a lineage in toys of that era. The buttons are little sealed things with a silicon S cover, so I'm going to leave them as they are, but I'll give the whole thing a good clean with some IPA, making sure I really get it in the toggle switches. So now to fix the battery door. As you can see the actual cover has these two hooks that have been broken off and so when it's on it just kind of flaps open completely defeating its point in existing. So I've been sitting around trying to think of ways to fix it and then I remembered I had this. It's a 3D doodle pen and if you believe the marketing it's a way of freehand 3D printing. But if you look at the box, so probably the best it can achieve, I'm not holding out much hope. But to be honest, kind of desperate for an excuse to use it. I've not actually had a chance to use it yet, so before I use it on the actual battery door, I'm going to have a little practice first on a scrap piece of plastic. I'm actually really impressed with the quality of this, it's got a real solid metal design. So now it's just heating up, when it gets to the right temperature, I'll press the button that will engage some motors that's going to pull the filament through. Okay, it's coming out now, so I'm going to have a go on this quality test piece. <laughs> oh, 
Okay, this is pretty a bad start. It's just melted straight through and it's going out the other side. Clearly, not really what a Pringles lid is designed for. Okay then, I'll try this slightly harder piece of plastic. <laughs> Unprecedented success. It didn't even remotely stick. Well, clearly that's enough practice. It's time for the real thing. For some reason I've got it in my head that it's gonna be more successful as I'm looking at this plastic and from inspection alone, I think it's somewhere in between the Pringles lid and this black plastic clip. I think the trick with this 3D pen is it needs to melt the plastic enough that it will stick, but not too much that it will go straight through. And on that scale of between the Pringles lid and this black plastic clip, I think this battery compartment is closer to the clip. So if it is, no harm done. And if not, it's gonna work perfectly. So here it goes. but it looks like it came straight out of the factory. So to be honest, I did half expect it to look like this, a couple of dog turds, but it is stuck. And that's the important thing for me. So the plan now is to gently file it down. And I mean gently, because I don't think it's the strongest thing in the world. And hopefully we can get it in some kind of shape that looks like the battery compartment hooks that were originally there. And by the power of editing, time has passed and much filing has occurred, as well as many a under the desk questionable activity during a Teams meeting. But here's the result. It's not perfect, but I've got to admit, I'm pretty pleased with it. So before the big reveal, we see whether it fits or not. I mean, obviously I did test it along the way. I'm not a madman. Let's put the whole thing back together. In all my time collecting handhelds, I've never had this problem. And well, it's a size issue. Trying to fit these batteries in this battery holder is ridiculous, it's just so tight. I know AA batteries are a standard and there is some tolerance on the length, so they do vary in size, but why would they pick the shortest length? It's just crazy. So AA batteries can be anything from 49.2 to 50.5 milliliters in length. But look at the size of the container, even ignoring the springs, that's going to be tight. My usual go-to battery is an Amazon rechargeable, but they were just a no-go. So I'm going to have to do the cardinal sin and make them match. It just seems crazy that they make it this tight. I mean, have AA batteries been getting bigger since the 80s? Let me know in the comments if you know. Like a glove. Even if you're not familiar with Entex, their logo may look familiar to you. It was designed by Ben Templeton, who was better known as a cartoonist at the time, and was based around the Royal Air Force Roundel logo, with a smiley face in the middle. It was chosen as a nod to Garth Clowns, or Tony as I think he liked to be known then, being British. And before they began selling in the UK, they actually asked permission to use it from the RAF, which was granted.
it was all back together and the battery is finally in, it's now time for a quick play. There's not much to the controls as you probably would expect. There's an on off button, directional ones, a fire button and also an extra switch for difficulty level, whether it be professional or amateur. Let's turn the light down so the camera can see the screen better. So as you can see, it's your standard Space Invaders game, and it is easy enough to play with the lights on, or fairly bright light, because the screen does light up. And it's probably also easier if you're not hugging a camera. I'm pretty pleased how things turned out. But you know what, with a bit of practice, I might even get to switch it to Pro. I love the history of Entex and their impact on the gaming industry. And this handheld was a key part in that. And for many, it's what they think of when they think of Entex. And if you enjoyed the video and you made it this far, a like and subscribe would be amazing. But most of all, thanks for watching. <laughs>